Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm hi everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lila LaHood, publisher of the San Francisco Public Press. We also have uh, Daphne Magnawa here, who is our director of membership and community. Uh, Daphne and I will be uh, taking your questions from the chat. Feel free to submit your questions at any point during the evening. And uh, after the initial discussion, uh, Max Pringle will be taking those and presenting them to our panelists. You are joining us this evening for Using the Ballot to Fight Corruption. Um, In San Francisco, we've had some recent scandals with public officials abusing their power for personal, political, or sometimes organizational gain. Uh, Most recently, uh, there was an FBI investigation into the Department of Public, Public Works looking into alleged kickbacks, slush funds, and illicit permitting influence. So we want to know how can voters use the ballot box as a tool to hold local government accountable. Um, On the upcoming November 3rd ballot, we do have Proposition B, which is an anti-corruption measure that would split the Department of Public Works into two and add more independent oversight. Um, And there are some other uh, propositions and reform proposals that have presented uh, in the past and are currently up for debate. Tonight, our guests, who are two veteran good government experts, um, are here to join us for this conversation. We welcome uh, Carmen uh, uh, Balber, Executive Director of Consumer Watchdog, and Larry Bush, who is a member of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Thank you both for being here. And now I would like to hand things off uh, to our host for tonight's discussion, Max Pringle, um, who has done quite a bit of reporting on this and will be leading our conversation. Uh, Max, take it away. Thank you. Um, Max, you're on, you're on mute. Okay, did I go on mute there? Am I, how am I now? Okay, awesome. All right, I was as Lila was mentioning, we're pleased to uh, welcome Carmen Balber, Executive Director of Consumer Watchdog, and Larry Bush, who's a member of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Um, welcome, Larry and Carmen. Um, Prop B, as Lila mentioned, is on the San Francisco ballot, and it proposes splitting a new Department of Streets and Sanitation off from the Department of Public Works and creating oversight commissions for both. Um, so let's uh, get a response. Um, uh, first, from you, Larry Bush uh, of the San Francisco Ethics Commission, your, just your general take on this as a potential corrective. I think Larry is muted as well. I'm not speaking for the Ethics uh-huh. Commission, but for yes. me personally. Yes. Um, and uh, by way of additional background, before I was on the Ethics Commission, I was on the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And that is the area where there is funding available for streets and sidewalks and uh, other things that the Department of Public Works does, such as construction of San Francisco General and so on. There clearly is a problem of uh, putting too many eggs in one basket and some things get messed up along the way. Uh, Secondly, there's a problem of, in general, how we design bonds, how we design our programs. It was three years onto the bond oversight committee before the committee itself voted to institute uh, an after action report where we surveyed the residents to see if what was done was what they had in mind. Because we had seen a number of cases, for example, I live in the Castro one of the things that the bonds did was to widen sidewalks in the Castro. That was because there was gonna be heavy foot traffic. Of course, it now turns out to be a good idea for putting outside patio dining, but at the time that wasn't the thought. So it ended up narrowing the street traffic to such an extent that many businesses lost uh, customers. And so we had a high rate of uh, closed businesses on Castro Street, which was very unusual. But no one came along afterwards and said, well, did you get what you wanted? In what ways was it not what you thought you were getting? So to the extent that it's not just uh, city contractors and city employees who are making these decisions, but there's greater public input, then I think that the public is better served. Uh, 
Carmen Butler, you've been um, advocating for good government for years. And what are these kinds of, uh, I want to get your take on these kinds of boards and commissions that's being proposed in Prop B. Um, generally, how effective are those? It always depends. Make sure I'm not muted good. Uh, it, it depends 100% on the independence and accountability of uh, the kind of commission you create. So who does it answer to? Does it have independent power? Um, and uh, can it follow through on what it promised? What are its concrete powers and responsibilities? And so I think with Proposition B, um, which I have no real opinion on the splitting of the department, if it should be two or one, um, but as far as the commission goes, it's, it's um, I think a step forward, but a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, you uh, have two commissions that are uh, made up of five political appointees. Um, those appointees are spread out between the mayor, the board of supervisors and the controller. Um, and so on one level, you're breaking up the, you know, the vast power that was concentrated in the hands of one person at the top of the Department of Public Works and breaking it up into five different people who hopefully would be a check and balance on each other, right? But at the same time, they're political appointees um, who can be fired at will, which I think is an, an unfortunate flaw in the measure. Um, and so there's some independence there and also a little bit of lack if there's political pressure from the people who appointed them to do the wrong thing. And the, how about this idea of giving these uh, boards and commissions um, the kind of teeth they need, maybe say subpoena power, things like that. Uh, let's first get your take, Carmen, and then we'll go to Larry. Um, the powers and authorities of these commissions are really key. And we've seen in other instances how subpoena power can really be an incredibly important authority for a commission to have teeth. Um, at the end of the day, these commissions are answering to the mayor. Um, and so hopefully they will have the ability to exercise that kind of authority. I don't see it in the ballot measure. Um, maybe Larry uh, is a little bit more expert on the measure to know if they would have it uh, specifically. You know, what we've seen um, uh, in other circumstances as well is that for a commission to be functional, uh, they need a staff and they need a budget. And it'll be very interesting to see how much of the um, funding that goes into the office of the department, of, the head of the Department of Public Works now transfers over to these commissions, how much backup they have, or are they meeting uh, and left without staff to implement uh, the changes that they want to implement? Larry, go I would, ahead. I would add just to, uh, uh, to every, I agree with everything that, that was just said. Beyond uh, Carmen's points, I think it's important that there be term limits on commissioners. Uh, there were term limits on the bond oversight committee that I served on and there's term limits on the ethics commission. I think that that's uh, a helpful thing. Uh, secondly, I think that it's good to have a, a, uh, a program that allows you to ask questions of below the executive director level because under the city's rules, that's uh, interfering in the management of the department. But if you want information and you wanna get it back fairly soon, then you ought to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the director of sidewalks as opposed to the overall thing. And that's not something that, that has to do with. It. So in addition to uh, having a budget and a staff, I think that they need to have independent legal uh, representation. And I think they need to have some independent hiring authority so that when they hire people, it doesn't have to go through the now troubled DHR. Maybe I'll, if you don't mind, Max, I'll interject sure. one thing there because Larry re reminded me, um, one thing I thought was really good about this public commission structure is that um, in order to meet the, uh, requirements of the Brown Act, which is that public decision making among boards and commissions has to be done in public, um, they're going to have to meet. And when a commission meets, there has to be public comment. And so the public is going to have a venue and a route uh, to weigh in on the decisions of both of these new agencies that um, I'm sure they don't have now with one person in charge of it all. Absolutely, Absolutely right. 
Larry, I want to get uh, just to circle back with you on that one point about term limits. Um, what are the good aspects of that? Does that just prevent this sort of patronage kind of position? Um, because this, these commissions are linked to the mayor and the board of suits. And also, uh, uh, people who are appointed to commissions often have some sort of political heft of their own, either financial or because they represent a certain group. So you have people who sit on the airport commission who have been there for 20 years, and the world has changed a lot. Uh, if you take a look at the ethics commission, for example, we have term limits of, uh, of one six-year term, and that's it. Uh, you can't even be reappointed. I think that's not a bad solution to the situation. Look at what's changed since we started talking about ethics and government and good governments. Most of it came out of the Richard Nixon era and how money was flowed in those days. But our answer in San Francisco initially was to say, let's track money that was going to contractors. Well, contractors are only a small part of the people who influence City Hall. And we have a whole ocean of people who influence City Hall who we do not track in terms of their contributions or provide any restrictions on them. So there needs to be uh, fresh people with fresh eyes to say, this is how the world has changed. That's interesting. Um, I wanna to get to this idea um, and we'll get back to um, whether or about the idea about these boards being a good sort of um, you know, eyes of the people, shall we say on power. Um, but first I wanted to touch a little bit about this one other aspect of Prop B, which is splitting um, this department to better handle one of San Francisco. And I think most probably major American cities, uh, this idea of dirty streets and, and how this has just become in recent years, especially with the rise of, of homelessness in a lot of these big cities, how this has become almost unmanageable and that by, thereby by splitting uh, this department into two, you get better focus in, sort of laser-like focus on this problem. Um, all right, let's just get a, a take from you on that. Uh, what do you think, just as a general idea? Sorry, me or Larry? Uh, you first, Carmen, and then we'll go to Larry. You know, I have to admit that I'm neither a, an expert in um, uh, public sanitation or um, public works. So I, I don't think that I can really give you um, uh, an expert opinion on whether or not it makes sense to break up these two agencies as far as their functionality goes. I, I would, um, I tend to be sympathetic uh, to the concern that you're creating a second set of administrative functions um, for you know, one agency that is now becoming two, but at the same time, I think it'll be easier for uh, commissions to oversee a smaller agency, um, review the contracting. I mean, a critical piece of the, the ballot measure I think is requiring the state, or I'm sorry, the county uh, controller to audit uh, these departments. Um, and it's a lot easier to do that kind of in-depth digging into contracts and other issues if you have a smaller agency. So perhaps on that front, I think it's a good idea. As far as the functioning of the department goes, I might not know the answer to that. No, that's all right. Larry, your take. Well, well, the controller was given the authority to begin doing audits back in the early 90s. And it was because of dirty streets. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce and others uh, had uh, a big beef about the fact that the city streets were not being kept clean. And so they asked for uh, an audit function to be created and that it have benchmarks and regular reports on, among other things, parks and sidewalks and streets. Um, I think that that's, that's a good approach. And I think that both the current controller and the previous one at Harrington uh, did a very good job with all of that, but they did it uh, in, a, in, in something of a, a truncated form, which is that, I will just say this, as a general rule, government does not do a good job of monitoring itself. And so you can go through and say, is the OCC doing a good job of monitoring police? No, it is not. Is DHR doing a good job of monitoring discrimination in the workplace? No, it is not. Is the Ethics Commission doing a good job of monitoring money and influence peddling? No, it is not. 
it's doing what it can, but as a general rule, there are a variety of forces arrayed to curtail that. Some of it is the city attorney who not only represents the ethics commission and any complaints that we are dealing with, but they represent the people who are the city officials that we are investigating. So you have the same people who are being represented in some cases by the exact same attorney as who serve ethics and who serve to oversee the official who's being questioned about their ethics. Same thing goes on at the police department with OCC. So I think that there is um, a cultural change that has to be looked at. Other cities have uh, a public advocate, for example, which was an idea that was floated here, didn't end up going anywhere, may not have been as well designed as it, as it could have been. But there is a, a need for outside oversight that takes the 30,000 foot view of things. And on that same vein about um, keeping uh, city agencies manageable, um, do you think, uh, Carmen Valver, we'll start with you. Um, do you think having smaller agencies makes it easier to sort of keep them honest, for lack of a better word? It makes it easier if you've got the right person doing it. And I, and I, I think Larry is absolutely right that government or anyone doesn't police themselves, right? Uh, you know, everyone in San Francisco agree that would probably agree that um, the oil industry can't regulate the oil industry and the tech industry can't regulate tech companies. Um, it's the same with government. And so it really does depend on the structure of who's in charge. If you have a bunch of smaller agencies reporting to someone um, you could, it, it could devolve into the same situation as you have now. They still have to, there's someone at the top at the end of the day, right? Uh, whether it's uh, 20 agencies going up to one or two. Um, and so it really uh, depends on the quality and in, in the independence of, you know, who's outside looking in. All right. Um, my next question is, um, again, for both of you. Um, in researching this topic, I found numerous examples um, just in recent years of in other big cities of these sort of big pay-to-play schemes that we've saw um, recently here in San Francisco. Um, is this something that's just endemic of, you know, of big to medium-sized cities? Like you know, some of the examples I saw were New Orleans, Bell, California, Detroit, Michigan. Um, is, can or cities some, sometimes just, do they, they get too big for their britches? Uh, let's start with you, Carmen Bowler. Uh, is corruption in politics endemic? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's any uh, any way to dice that question uh, but to say yes. That I think the the bigger question is, um, you know, what do we do about it? And some of that is national change that none of us can do here in California because of the, uh, you know, Supreme Court decisions on corporations having a right to free speech, and that means political money. So political money isn't barred. Um, but when you're talking about the city level, it's obviously not just campaign contributions. I mean, the recent scandal involved tractors and trips and you know lots of things that have nothing to do with whether or not a company is um, technically uh, buying an election. Uh, they're buying a, a development or a, or a public and some other public, public benefit instead. instead. And so uh, on some level, um, there will always, corporations will always try to get the upper hand. It's our job to keep trying uh, to, you know, strengthen places like the Ethics Commission and, uh, you know, the, the public corruption agencies at the FBI and, and commissions like these, give them the teeth that they need to hold people accountable when they get caught. Uh, Larry Bush, same question. Uh, is this just a kind of a runaway problem in big cities of, of corruption. Well, if I may per be permitted to digress somewhat. Sure. I, I recall dropping into a church service once to see what was going on. And the minister was making the point that God has no grandchildren. And I thought that pulled me up short. And what do you mean by God has no grandchildren? Since God only has children. They don't have grandchildren that approach God through another person. And I think that's also true in government. We shouldn't be expecting other people to be standing in the place of us. 
we need to empower ourselves. So if you're gonna talk about how do we fix this, we really have to develop a culture that says that it's empowerment of the voters because democracy has no grandchildren. Democracy requires our own involvement and our own commitment to the energy that's involved. You know, the other thing I think about is that I don't know of anybody, any of the endorsing groups in this election who have made uh, compliance with ethics in general a criteria for endorsing anyone. Um, I have, I just, and I haven't seen that in any other elections either. It just does not show up as a criteria. Um, everyone wants to lash out at an individual actor who offends them with their values or their lack of values, but they don't look at the larger picture. I, 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 for another digression, if you remember Steel Magnolia, at, the, at one point, uh, uh, the, the two main actresses are having a dispute. And Shirley MacLaine says, I just want to hit somebody. And her friend says, hit Louisa. Everybody in the parish wants to hit Louisa as though hitting Louisa was going to address any of the issues that were there. And that's the same thing we do in our politics. We just lash out and hit whatever is convenient. Louisa happened to be sitting right next to her when she said that. So how do you then turn around and say that uh, you're going to begin expecting more in terms of ethic behavior and, and compliance with standards that we all believe are important if you're not involved in doing it yourself. All right, and with that, I'm gonna take a moment here to reintroduce you to, uh, for folks who might just be logging in. And while I'm doing that, it'll give an opportunity for some of our audience members to uh, type their questions in. We can get those questions to um, Carmen and Larry. Um, first of all, we've got with us uh, Le uh, Larry Bush, who is the San Francisco Ethics Commissioner. He's speaking on behalf of himself tonight and not on behalf of the Ethics Commission. And we've also got Carmen Balber. She's the Executive Director of Consumer Watchdog. It's a Los Angeles-based um, consumer um, watchdog organization that keeps an eye on big corporate malfeasance and government malfeasance. Am I scrubbing that right, Carmen? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, um, so we have, oh, I'm saying we have no questions yet from the audience. Um, but if you wanna get your questions in, uh, just go to the chat and type and we'll uh, try and get um, Larry and Carmen's answers to your questions. Um, Larry Bush wanted to get your take on the idea of having whistleblowers, the importance of having employee whistleblowers and whistleblower protections maybe as a possible corrective for keeping keeping government honest. Um, yeah, Larry, what do you think about that? I, I believe that whistleblowers are important and I believe that our whistleblower program is not up to snuff. Uh, the federal program has uh, a much more robust thing. Imagine that given the era of Trump, but if you file a complaint, you can file it in a number of different ways. In San Francisco up until now, you had to file it directly with your superiors and in the department where you worked. So if I found some federal misspending by the local government in using federal dollars locally and called up Nancy Pelosi and said, Congresswoman, look at what's going on here, how they're handing out the money and it's the money that you work to get uh, allocated to San Francisco and they fired you for having called her, you would have no recourse because in our system, there is no right to take a complaint outside, much less a, a complaint to uh, the press. So for example, we had a, a case of uh, the community college uh, chancellor. Who- SF City the, College? San Francisco City College. This was a, a 10 or 15 years ago, who was uh, making, poor decisions that were politically biased about allocating money. And a complaint came in to ethics and it was investigated and then it was put in a drawer. And it would have stayed there for a year. And in fact, it did stay there for almost a full year until someone who knew about it tipped off the 
Lance Williams, who was in at the examiner, and said, take a look at this, and they did. And then suddenly came a front page story. He lost his job, he was prosecuted, and all the rest of it would not have happened. And if anyone had known who that whistleblower was, he would have lost his job. That's wrong. So if you want good whistleblowing, you have to have good whistleblower protections. Carmen, uh, any take on that? We completely agree. Uh, we fought for whistleblower protections across the board, both at, uh, in the state um, and at the national level. So Larry is completely right. If you don't, if, if the people inside the government aren't able to identify wrongdoing, who's going to? I mean, the only way you prove bribery usually is getting a wiretap, but someone's got to tell the FBI you need to do a wiretap and give them some evidence it's happening. So you need a whistleblower to, to prosecute these kinds of cases and, and even to identify you know, lower level things that don't necessarily arise to criminality, uh, but still, uh, still, can, uh, still can be something to correct problems. I wanted to, um, if we have a second, I sure. wanted to um, bring up something that we had talked about, which was just, you know, can you can you reform government at the ballot? Is it is it a waste of time to try to put anti-corruption measures on the ballot? And Larry mentioned Watergate as the opening of you know our political reform movement in the country, and that's when California enacted the Political Reform Act, which is the statewide measure that regulates you know, everything from campaign contributions to politicians asking asking people to give to charities. Um, and the Political Reform Act was enacted. There is a fairly independent, it has some issues, but fairly independent commission with a full-time professional staff uh, that enforces the laws that were enacted under the, under the Political Reform Act. And it's that full-time professional staff that doesn't change political appointee to political appointee that I think is one of the most effective things about that agency. Is that the Fair Political Practices Commission in Sacramento? Exactly, exactly. All right, awesome. I think we've got our first question here and I'll read it to you um, from one of our uh, listeners. The Republican party is saying that, um, that, not, that not splitting the department of works into two will cost millions of dollars and it won't really increase accountability. Um, are there any examples of where a citizen commission increases accountability and transparency is, uh, is the question from a, a listener. Larry, do you wanna take that one first? Um, well, I, I think that the police commission, even though it doesn't uh, respond as fully as people want, does allow a, a level of transparency to raise questions. And it has authority uh, for the last 20 years to overturn for us, a complaint to go beyond the chief. In the past, complaints were adjudicated by the chief and the commission had no real authority over it. But they changed the rules so that the complaint can now be adjudicated by the commission itself. I think that's helpful. Okay, um, and um, I guess this one would also be for Larry because you're local. Uh, a, a listener asks, how does San Francisco compare to other cities in the Bay Area? Is corruption here better or worse? And is it possible to know, Larry? I think that uh, it's, it's broader because we have a city county government. So the, the functions are combined. For example, the health department is a county thing, but it's under the city. And so there's a, a, a doubling of opportunities to influence contracts and so forth. Same thing with the jail, uh, which is a, a county thing, but which is run by the city. And we elect the, the sheriff. So uh, in general, I would say that uh, there are efforts everywhere to influence government to the advantage of those who have the most power. And you can see what's going on in Los Angeles, I'm sure that that Carmen can talk a little bit about that because just as you have the FBI making prosecutions in San Francisco, you have the FBI making prosecutions in Los Angeles. And you have major discussion about does the ethics commission in Los Angeles need to be revamped in some ways, which is interesting because we use the Los Angeles ethics commission as our model for creating the San Francisco ethics commission. 
and we're stuck with the same kinds of questions. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's almost a function of, you know, how big is the city? The more money, the more people who are trying to sway who gets it. And so there's probably more corruption or at least a larger scale of corruption in San Francisco and LA just because of, you know, it's solely as a basis of size. There's more money flowing around. Okay. I, I, I just want to uh, broaden it out just a little bit to say that we still need to take a look at what we don't see. Um, at, for example, the Mueller report that took a look at uh, Russian potential influence in, in Washington. And he, in his final report, he had to say that we were unable to get a lot of information because people used a system to communicate to each other called Snapchat or some variation of that in which as soon as the message was read, it disappeared. And so Mueller was unable to obtain copies of the communications that might have provided a basis for some prosecution. That's on one side. The other side is there is something called geofencing in which uh, an, an entity can put a parameter around a, a, a building or an event and track whoever goes in it and what happened and follow them after they leave. So you could follow a person all the way to the voting booth. But the, what was first used in a major way was here in Northern California uh, by right to life people who wanted to track who was going to uh, abortion clinics. Um, now that's a pretty scary prospect for a lot of people. And yet we don't have any system that encompasses disclosures of folks who are engaged in that kind of, of effort. And we also set as a general rule that you don't have to disclose things until they reach about $1,000 and things like that cost nothing. So it's really a question more of who's, who are they doing rather than how much are they paying for it? Well, Larry We're brings in, oh, yeah. sorry, just let me, uh, Larry brings in uh, geofencing and geolocation and we're talking about San Francisco measures, but there's a measure on the statewide ballot, Prop 24, that would let you tell social media and other online companies, you can no longer use my geolocation, which doesn't get specifically at political actors uh, disclosing that they're doing it, but you can right. broadly tell companies online, don't track me, and then you have at least your location protected. It's a good start, right? Um, we're down to our last maybe four or five minutes here. I want to get another question in. Um, uh, here's a good one. How difficult will it be for the Ethics Commission to get that independent legal representation in? Um, Carmen, let's start with you. Is that a big, big hill to climb? Well, uh, so Larry's the expert on the San Francisco Ethics Commission. I'll let him answer that specifically on the Ethics Commission. Um, but I do believe in Prop B, uh, there is a provision that allows the commissions to hire outside counsel, uh, which is not letting the city attorney uh, represent the commissions if they have uh, a reason to suspect wrongdoing. But you know, the high hurdle is that there's nothing specific in the creation of the commissions that says you are charged with investigating X type of uh, nefarious activity. So it's really gonna be up to the city developing goals for the commissions to get into that kind of, uh, into that kind of investigation. All right. Uh, Larry, I think you're muted. The San Francisco Ethics Commission uh, change would require a vote of the people. It's a charter change to give them complete independent authority. Uh, and it's been raised before by several commissioners, but somehow the legwork needed to do it just never happened. Um, in order to get outside counsel, you can do it, but you have to get the permission of the city attorney that it's necessary to have outside counsel. Now there's a hurdle. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's despite the fact that we have a very uh, honest and good city attorney. I don't mean to, to put them down. Right. Um, so this next questioner says, this event is called using the ballot to fight corruption. Um, and they're asking, this is a good question. Is it really up to voters to make this happen? Uh, why aren't our elected officials doing more to cut down on this? Uh, Carmen Balber, let's start with you. 
Well, you know, elected officials never really want to acknowledge uh, that corruption is bad is as bad as it is. It's are you you're asking people to police themselves. Um, we didn't talk about this when we talked last, Max, but actually my organization worked with uh, local volunteers called the Oaks Project all the way back in 1999, 2000 to put a measure on the ballot called Prop J that at the time was the anti-kickback measure. It said, if you um, give a public benefit to an entity, a development contract, um, a, you know, or something like that, then that entity can't give you as a politician campaign contributions, uh, gifts or a job for a period of time after you voted in their benefit. And it took effect in San Francisco and a few other cities in the uh, state um, and then was overridden by the Ethics Commission, in fact, who did an overhaul of the campaign contribution laws and conveniently got rid of most of the teeth of that measure. Hasn't been in effect for years and years until back in 2017, which I have to acknowledge I missed and just figured out in pre preparation for this, um, where the Ethics Commission got together and said, hey, shouldn't we revisit the prote protections in this law that said, you know, you can't give a kickback to someone who just awarded you a city contract. And it was enacted in 2018, you know, in some modified form. So the public can enact change at the ballot. Sometimes politicians then go uh, around, set, turn around and overturn it. But, um, you know, that one move by volunteers in the city all the way back in 1999, ultimately led to stronger protections today when the Ethics Commission pulled those back into effect, along with the Board of Soups, of course. All right, let's move to one more question. And this is a good one. Um, this hits close to home because it's about journalism. Um, so this questioner asks, um, why did it take an investigation by the FBI uh, to get at the corruption? Um, how can, what can journalists do? What are good resources for them to um, sniff out the kind of graft and corruption and maybe uh, bring this to the public's attention sooner? Uh, Larry Bush, you wanna tackle that one first? I, I find that there's uh, great resources out there, groups like Maplight, uh, which follows the flow of money. Um, there are uh, other groups, uh, in addition, uh, Open Secrets is another group that you can follow and you can sign up and get their stuff at no charge. I think they have great materials. I think that uh, San Francisco's public press has done a great job, in fact, uh, I asked for uh, us to calendar an investigation into an issue that you covered extensively that in the, in the campaign in 2015 for the seat that Aaron Peskin was vying for against Julie Christensen, there was a meeting that took place uh, in a law office at the invitation of the then mayor, Ed Lee, and the then uh, president of the board Mark Farrell and the chair of the finance committee, London Breed, with lobbyists and contractors and unions, and to tell them, in the words of Ed Lee, according to the story, uh, I'll, I am watching, that they were not to give money to Aaron Peskin, but they were to support uh, Julie Lee. And one of the people who was there, according to the story, was Ron Conway who said, I know it may be difficult for some of you to give money directly this way. So if you will tell me how much you're giving, I will give it and we'll do it laundered through a different entity. There was an effort to investigate that by the city attorney, but it went nowhere because the people who were in the meeting would not talk. We don't have a requirement that says that they have to talk. I think we should. So one of the things that I'm asking for in a, a review is to resurface this whole discussion, not because it's uh, still timely for enforcement, but because there are lessons to be learned and things to be done as a result. Carmen, uh, your take on journalism's role. I think it's absolutely critical um, because for prosecution to happen, a lot needs to happen, a lot goes into a successful FBI sting and investigation. And all of the groundwork is the kind of painstaking, nitpicking, uh, investigating that groups like MapLite, our group does some of it, but 
critically the public that the San Francisco public press and other members of the media do, um, you're the only one who can call a politician and make them feel obligated to answer a question about ethical problems um, that I call a politician and they're not gonna answer. The ethics commission calls and their lawyer is gonna advise them not to answer. But when you call, they're answering the public. And so that's just such a critical role. Um, uh, Larry can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that ballot measure that I mentioned that the commission re then revamped and um, enacted into law, I think it also required a reporting of, um, it required city contractors to report if uh, they were giving the campaign contribution, if they had also received a city contract in uh, the recent past. Um, am I wrong that there's a database of that information somewhere? Or at it, least is true that, it is true that it, is, it does require that, but uh, they also required uh, an annual audit of at least one lobbyist every mm -hmm. year. But the commission has said that it has lacked the funding. So since it was passed five years ago, they have never done an audit on any lobbyist. Well, I think that maybe that information is public information, so you could go check it out, Max. All right, I'm on <laughs> it. Do the audit. <laughs> I, right, I, I, will say, I, I, I have to say in defense for what the Ethics Commission has done, that the executive director uh, issued in its monthly report to the commissioners, uh, what's not gonna be done uh, under the current budget. And which she said flat out that corruption will continue without being addressed. And when that was put in writing from the executive director to the commission and the commission accepted that report, I said, how can somebody plan on running for re-election? We have six members of the board who have vacant seats, five of them or four of them are up for re-election. How could you run on a platform that says, I'm not gonna provide the funding to deal with corruption, which the ethics commission has just said is gonna continue without this funding, but they did. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Um, our guests have been Carmen Valber. Uh, she is executive director of Consumer Watchdog. She's at consumerwatchdog.org for more information. Uh, our other guest has been Larry Bush with the San Francisco Ethics Commission. I want to thank Larry for joining us. I want to thank everybody who's tuned in. And I want to pass it back to Lila LaHood and give her my thanks as well. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Larry. We appreciate you joining us this evening for this great conversation. Just a couple of final words uh, for everyone who joined us tonight as audience members. Thank you both on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, we will be uh, making this video available. We will also be producing a civic episode from this conversation. And I'd like to direct everyone's attention to a couple of things on our website. We have a brand new story from Max on this topic. With corruption on the ballot, San Francisco could learn oversight from other scandal-plagued cities. It's right now it's featured on our homepage. And within that story, there is another civic episode also on this. So if you if you are uh, a podcast listener, I think you'll you'll enjoy listening to that. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, one last thing. If you have not voted yet, we have a comprehensive nonpartisan voter guide. It is highlighted on the top of our website. If you have questions about Proposition B or any of the other local ballot measures, uh, we've got some, some great, um, great information there uh, presenting um, uh, analysis of all of those prop propositions and um, some responses from candidates in local races. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and we hope to see you at our next event. Good night. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.